Hello ladies and gents, this is the first of three interviews I recorded for my documentary The Making of Monkey Island and if you haven't watched that yet then I recommend doing so before you listen to this. This is my interview with Ron Gilbert and it is audio only. Ron and Dave's interviews were audio only and then Mark Ferrari's has video too. The other two interviews will be uploaded in the next couple of weeks so keep an eye out for those. In case you didn't already know, after working on several Lucasfilm games, including co-creating Maniac Mansion, Ron created the concept of Monkey Island and led the team. After leaving Lucasfilm, he established Humongous Entertainment and subsequently Terrible Toy Box, who created Thimbleweed Park. You can find Ron on Twitter at GrumpyGamer. He also has a blog over at GrumpyGamer.com. And details about Thimbleweed Park can be found at either terribletoybox.com or thimbleweedpark.com. Links for all these can be found below in the video description. Now a small disclaimer, this wasn't just my first interview for the documentary, it was my first interview that I've ever done in my life. Coupled with the fact that this was Ron Gilbert, I was rather nervous, so I'm probably not the world's best interviewer. Thankfully Ron is a great interviewee. I've edited out some pleasantries at the start, so we'll just jump right into the questions. Hope you all enjoy it. So I'm just looking at my notes for sort of questions for you. And I think because I've been doing a lot of research in the past week or so, some of the some of the things I know the answer to. So maybe I'll gloss over those. So apologies if I jump back and forth. Or you could try to trick me, you know, make sure that I have the <laughs> same answer. Yeah, I could actually. <laughs> Well, I mean, there there is a lot of misinformation out there, right? I mean, I just read through the Wikipedia page and I go, where do these people get this information? So That's feel free to ask them again, because it may be that they're not actually right. Okay, I'll tell you what, I'll just go through the list as I have it then and, and we'll, okay. we'll get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. <laughs> um, yeah. um, so... Just the, the basic idea of Monkey Island, e even before maybe it was even called Monkey Island, um, when was that idea first mentioned? And, and when you first mentioned it to other people, how kind of far along had that process formed in your mind? Well, I had finished working on Maniac Mansion, and I was kind of thinking about another project. And I, you know, I came up with a few you know, ideas that really never went anywhere. You know, they're just ideas. And I wrote, I wrote down one page and it was very common back at Lucasfilm at the time that people would write little one page uh, design documents and then pass them around the office. And people would comment on them and give feedback. And, you know, you'd sit down and chat with people. And I did this for, I don't know, maybe probably three or four ideas um, post Maniac Mansion. And nothing really gained a lot of traction. You know, nothing was really super exciting. And I was really kind of thinking about, you know, games like King's Quest. And you know, at the time, I mean, actually the entire time, really, uh, King's Quest, you know, and the games from Sierra sold a lot better than Lucasfilm games did in the U.S. Um, the situation was reversed in Europe. Right, Lucasfilm mm -hmm. sold much better than Sierra in Europe, but in the U.S., um, you know, Sierra was just selling a lot better, and I was really trying to kind of figure out why. And and I think that things like King's Quest, you know, had a fantasy environment, which was very popular back then, and it, I mean, it is today. You know, fantasy is a huge kind of genre in, in games. And, you know, King Quest kind of had this fantasy genre, and I started thinking about, well, I wonder if that is one of the things that kind of makes it so successful. And I didn't, I don't really like fantasy. I'm not really a big fantasy fan. I don't read fantasy, and I mean, I'll go to Lord of the Rings movies and stuff, but I'm not a big fantasy fan and i didn't really want to make a game you know about dragons and such and i started thinking about um just started thinking about them more and that's really where things like pirates came up because uh, uh, you know pirates actually share a lot in common with fantasy and 
And I thought, well, maybe if I did a game about pirates, I could kind of do fantasy without actually doing fantasy, which I didn't really like. And so that's really where the whole idea of pirates kind of sprung up, was was from that idea. Hmm. Okay. Um, So just sort of moving into the development side of things, uh, once the project got going... Did you handpick the team that would be working on Monkey Island? Well, you know, once I kind of had the idea of pirates, you know, that's when I I started working on the story and or stories. I went through a lot of stories, you know, kind of trying to figure out, you know, what what I wanted to do. And, you know, I got maybe six months into that process and then I was pulled off the project and I was put on to the Indiana Jones adventure game with David Fox and Noah Falstein. And so Mickey Allen kind of went on hold for, I guess, probably almost a year, you know, while I went off and I did, uh, I did Indiana Jones. Then when Indiana Jones ended, then I came back and I continued to, to kind of flush stuff out. And at that point, I think during Indiana Jones, we had hired um, some more kind of programmers and you know people like Steve Purcell had done a lot of the art for um, for the Indiana Jones game. Mm-hmm. And so you know I was familiar with him by working on that. And we had also hired um, some new programmers to work in the scum system. I think there were four of them that we had hired. And so that was um, you know I kind of had that pool of people to really choose from you know, in terms of programmers and, you know, Steve was kind of a natural because we didn't really have another project going on. So, you know, that's when Steve came on. And then Mark Ferrari, who did all the art for Loom, you know, he was Mm -hmm. kind of Mm -hmm. around. And Mark and I became really good friends at that point. You know, he had a little house up in, um, up the coast in California. And I would often go up there and just spend several days writing Monkey Island stuff you know, because it was this weird little secluded house and and it was kind of a nice thing to do. So Mark and I became really good friends. And so, so that's kind of, I, you know, I think how the team kind of emerged. Okay. Um, so what was a typical day like while developing Monkey Island? (laughs) Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of, a lot of chaos you know and kind of kind of good chaos it wasn't it wasn't bad chaos but you know when i came off of um came off of the indiana jones game and started working on mickey island there you know there were a lot of things especially with the design and then the story a little bit that weren't like fully completely formed and at the time that Monkey 1 and Monkey 2 was done, Monkey 2 is a little different. Things were a lot more formed. But for Monkey 1, you know, we were not required to do um, design documents. The company didn't require that. So you know, I probably started into that project before I should have you know, with, in terms of getting, you know, the design and the story just completely locked down. And so a lot of, a lot of Monkey Island was, was me designing, you know, two or three steps ahead of what people were actually implementing. So there was a lot of, a lot of chaos on that, on that front, but it was also, it was also very refreshing in some ways because, you know, I've, I've often equated, you know, those two games to kind of improv game design. You know, we were just, mm. you know, working on the game and I was, you know, designing stuff and, and just really reacting kind of to to what we had seen implemented and going, oh, well, that's really interesting. Let's do more of that, you know? So, it, I mean, it's the kind of thing you, well, I guess a lot of indie developers do get away with that these days, but it would be hard to get it. It'd be hard for me to get away with that these days. You know, a game like a game like Thimbleweed Park, you know, we spent a lot of time kind of designing that game up front and really knew what we were building um, mm. going forward. I, I think being able to kind of do that weird kind of improv game design. I think, you know, I think I could probably do that when I was younger, 
but I think I think now it's like there's a lot more going on in my life. There's a lot more things I want to do, you know, mm. and it's being able to have a very kind of structured button down project is kind of important to me now. Hmm. Um, interesting. You said sort of that, you, you know, you didn't need to have do design documents and this and the other. And I, I know Lucas uh, film were kind of hands off with the games division uh, for the most part. Right. Um, so did you actually have to pitch the idea at all when you first came up with it? Not formally, no. Um, you know, Steve Arnold was the head of the Lucasfilm Games Group at the time, and I know I kind of talked to him about the game, and but it, there was never a, a pitch process. And I know that changed right after I left Lucasfilm. You know, by the time, um, you know, the Sam and Max and, you know, Full Throttle and those games came about, Lucasfilm was requiring, you know, more, you know, design documents and actual pitches for stuff. But for Monkey Island 1 and Monkey Island 2, I, I never pitched those games, not in an official way. I mean, I certainly talked, um, you know, to Steve about them, but, but I never had to pitch them. Okay. And how long was the development process in total, do you think, from kind of the, the formulating of the idea and then the actual development? Well, I mean, it was it was probably a year longer than it, needed to be just because I had to take a break to go work on the Indiana Jones game. Mm. But, you know, if you kind of remove that, um, you know, I probably spent maybe six, six or nine months working on the game before we went into production, which was in another nine months. So mm -hmm. maybe 18 months in total. Okay. Um, so you you mentioned the uh, a little bit of competition with Sierra, which was uh, kind of uh, the reverse in Europe. Um, right. Now, which kind of aspects of adventure games in general or Sierra games did you want to avoid going into um, developing your own adventure games? Well, with Maniac Mansion you know, we, we dropped the parser, right? That was the thing I hated the most about Sierra games was the, the typing, right? I really, I mean, the first thing that really intrigued me about the Sierra games before, you know, I had done Maniac Mansion was just that they were graphic adventures, right? I had played adventure games from like Infocom and, you know, even back in my university days, you know, the original adventure stuff. And I played those and I, I really enjoyed those. And I and I was very intrigued by by Sierra because these things felt um, graphical, and they weren't they weren't graphics like oh well here's a static picture, right? They were they were graphics in, in terms of you know the guy would actually walk around and you'd move him around and things were animated and and I was really intrigued by that, but I really did not like the parser, which was kind of where Maniac Mansion came from and the whole you know scum interface you know, ditching the parser. So that was one thing I didn't really like. The other thing that I didn't like, and I really hadn't kind of formulated this idea until after Indiana Jones, but was the death part of it. You know, the Sierra games really seemed to revel in death, right? It was it was something that the game would actually chastise you for. And I always felt like the designers of those games actually took pleasure, you know, in in setting up a situation where the um you know where the player would you know would actually die and there are lots of places in maniac mansion where the player could die and you can get into no win situations and kind of post indiana jones i really thought you know i don't think the player should be able to die you know you should not be able to get into bad situations where you're constantly having to save the game because you're afraid you're going to make a mistake and I think that I think you know that was one of the things I really didn't like about the Sierra games. That with Monkey Island, you know, at least to some degree, probably mostly, you know, I kind of fixed that issue with that game. Do you think that having death like that in an adventure game kind of removed some of the immersion? Um, I don't know if it's I don't know if I'd use the word immersion. It's certainly it certainly was frustrating and i think it made i think it made the 
the player afraid to do things, right? They were, they were overly cautious. And I mean, there's, there's two kinds of death in adventure games. There's, there's death in that I walked into the lava pit type death and Sierra certainly had that. And then there's another kind of death, which is, it's not really death, but it's that you've got yourself in an unwinnable situation that you've, you've used some inventory object that can only be found once in the world and you've used it in the incorrect way and it's gone now. And so those were kind of two things that I wanted, I wanted to solve. So I don't, I don't know if immersion is the right word. I think it's just, it allows the player to maybe more peacefully play the game because they're not constantly worried that they're going to lose all the progress because they have to go load a save game. Mm. Um, so kind of looking back over um, the things you did developing Monkey Island, would you do anything differently, do you think, if you, if you could go back knowing what you know now? <laughs> yes, <laughs> a lot. Um, you know, as I was just, I was actually just playing Monkey Island yesterday. And um, I, I think any time I, I start up a new adventure game, I always go back and I play Monkey Island. And I just, I just kind of want to get my head back in that, in that state, right? I mean, even though the game, you know, has nothing to do with Monkey Island, it's just, it's, it's a new, it's a new adventure game, and I wanna, I wanna kind of go back. And so I was just playing Monkey Island yesterday, and I was, you know, commenting to my wife about the fact that, you know, in Monkey Island there was no, there was no like fast walking. Right in Thimbleweed Park, if you double click, the character mm-hmm. fast walks. Right, yeah. and that's a real standard thing in adventure games these days. Is you can do that, and Monkey Island didn't have that. And it's just it's it's little things like that that are just incredibly frustrating, you know, to go back and play those games. And if you look at a game like Thimbleweed Park, you know, we went through and kind of fixed all those little irritating things. You know, all those things mm. that I found irritating about Monkey Island, like fast walking, like, you know, characters never repeating information twice in conversations, right? That was, I mean, that's something that just drives me crazy about Monkey Island is you have a conversation with somebody and they tell you something and there's no way to get that information again from them, right? You can't go back and go, hey, what was that thing you wanted again? Um, and so it's kind of lost information. And that was just, I mean, it's the way things were done back then. But I think today for kind of a more modern audience playing a point and click game, that just, they're not willing to, you know, go through that. And so I think, I think most of the frustrations I had with Monkey Island kind of from a user standpoint were, were kind of dealt with in Thimbleweed Park. Hmm. Um, this might be one of the one of the ones that I think I know the answer to, but you, you may tell me differently. But um, just really, the, what the main influences were for uh, you know the, the thematically and tonally for the for the pirate theme, um, where where did the kind of major influences come from? Well, there were there were probably two major influences, and you know before I did before I went on to Indiana Jones, I was. I was really kind of stymied a little bit with 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 the story, and that was that was when I just happened to just by coincidence you know read the book on Stranger Tides, which you know Tim Powers wrote, mm-hmm. and that that book was like this real kind of eye opener for me, because in that book there were two things that kind of made everything that I was thinking about for monkey island really click and one was that the protagonist in the story was kind of a fish out of water a little bit right he was not a seasoned pirate he and and that was one of those things that i really thought about monkey island because i'd always thought about monkey island you know the protagonist which later became guybrush as kind of being a seasoned pirate right and that's really if you look at the sierra games you know you're playing police quest and you're a seasoned cop in police quest and you're you know all these things you're you're a seasoned person and 
reading, you know, reading on Stranger Tides and realizing, oh, the protagonist is kind of a fish out of water. He's not really, he doesn't really understand this world that he's in. That made a lot of a lot of sense to me, and a lot of stuff with Monkey Island really clicked at that point because that's when I started thinking about, you know, the player is really in that situation too, right? The player is not a seasoned pirate, and so it's really nice to be able to push this you know protagonist into the world that doesn't know what's going on because the player doesn't know what's going on and so they can both learn at the same time you know about what it is to be a pirate and and that was so much so that the i mean the very beginning line of monkey island is you know my name is a guy and i want to be a pirate i mean he just states right at the beginning of the game I don't know anything about this. And and I think it really it really kind of helps the player you know relate to the character and it helps it helps with the game design because you can introduce the main character to things at the same time you introduce the the player to things. So that that was like a, a big inspiration for me, you know, from kind of a story standpoint. And the other was really the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. You know, I had always loved that ride as a kid. And there's just this feeling to that ride, especially at the very beginning. Although I think they've changed it a lot. So now it's a lot like the movie, which is unfortunate. But at the beginning of the ride, you know, it's it's very slow and there's lots of blues and it's nighttime. And I think you're in the Louisiana Bayou. And, and I just, I just, I loved that kind of environment a lot. And so when Mark started doing the art, you know, I said, I want it to be like Pirates of the Caribbean, right? And I wanted, and and really that was an aesthetic thing. I wanted to aesthetically feel like you're in a Pirates of the Caribbean ride. And that's where a lot of the stuff that Mark and Steve did, you know, especially the beginning, you know, in Melee Island, there's all those lovely blues going on in the world. And that, that really all comes from the Pirates of the Caribbean, right? Wow. Um, so just m- moving away from Guybrush to, to the rest of the characters, um, because Monkey Island, I mean, it has so many characters with personality, like even the really small roles, everyone seems to have a lot of personality. And did these personas kind of evolve naturally while you were developing the story and the puzzles, or did you create some of the characters first? Like particularly, um, you know, you've got two strong female characters in there, Elaine and, and uh, the Swordmaster, you know, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, did they, did they, yeah, did they kind of evolve with the development or was it a bit of both? Yeah, they, they, they evolved with the development. I mean, a lot of, you know, like I said, you know, designing that game was kind of an exercise in chaos. And so, you know, a lot of the details, you know, Elaine... Elaine was kind of switched to a woman. Originally, the person who was supposed to be the governor of the island was Governor Fat, who appeared in Monkey Island 2 as the governor of island. And so I switched, you know, I switched um, her to, I switched that character to be Elaine uh, in, in Monkey Island. The Swordmaster, I'm not really sure exactly how the Swordmaster came about, I mean, I do remember having this weird questioning about about everyone's assumption at the time, you know, on the team was really that the Swordmaster was a man, right? Mm-hmm. And so I remember thinking, well, what if what if she was a woman, right? That would be interesting, you know? And then there was this woman who worked in the product support department at Lucasfilm um, named Carla. And... I, I don't I don't know how it happened, but even if you look at the picture of the Swordmaster in Monkey Island, that is Carla from Product Support. It looks exactly like her, and so it was. I, I'm and I'm not really sure how that happened, right? So I'm, I'm not really sure how how that character became Carla from Product Support, but um, but there was that that initial questioning of like, well, why does the Swordmaster have to be a man? Let's let's make the swordmaster a woman. And it was better for it, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it yeah. was. Um. Now, um. 
I understand that, you know, Monkey Island wasn't an immediate success by any means. Mm -hmm. Um, But obviously it's, you know, it's gained traction since and has has become this huge sort of cult classic. And it's it's so well loved, especially kind of over here in the UK. I'm sure I'm sure it is stateside as well. But um, kind of in Europe, it's, it's such a massive thing. When do you think that it kind of started to gain traction with its popularity? Um, well, I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, releasing it in Europe, you know, that, you know, we, we were very, we were very like a U.S. focused, right? Um, you know, our team. And then we got ahead of marketing a Lucasfilm, a guy named Doug Glenn, and I think he had lived in Europe. I think he lived in Italy for several years. And so he he was always like, we have to go to Europe. We have to go to Europe, you know. And I think Sierra Online had kind of licensed the King's Quest stuff to, I think, Activision. It's like mm-hmm. the old Activision, but uh, to Activision. And so I think, I think Activision kind of, you know, had the rights to all of Europe for this stuff. And I think one of the things that Doug Glenn did was he said, no, we're going to go to each individual country and do deals with distributors in each country. And I think his, his philosophy at the time was, if we do that, these individual distributors in Germany and Spain and the UK and stuff will have a lot more vested interest in this game because it is a game for their market, right? And I think he was really right about that. And I think I think that's one of the things that kind of made Monkey Island really explode in Europe is is that you know those those deals were not Europe as this big, you know, giant entity, but it was deals with Spain and deals with France and deals with Germany and and I think it gave those people a lot more ownership, you know, over Mm. um over the title and i think helped you know help them promote it a lot better Mm. um i don't know if there's anything intrinsically about the humor of the game or the setting of the game that you know appeals to europeans more than americans i don't think there is so i don't i don't really i don't really know you know what that is and i think you know like you said mckellen won you know, it came out, and you know, at, I mean, today you release a game, and 24 hours later, right, everyone's playing it, and there's reviews everywhere, and all that stuff. That wasn't the case back then. You know, we would release a game, and it would spend months, you know, in manufacturing, getting hundreds of thousands of floppy disks pressed, and then it had to be shipped to stores, and then, you know, so it was months between when we would finish a game, and it would actually come out on the shelves, and. And I and I and I, I know I was very disappointed in the kind of sales of Monkey Island, but you know I had started working on Monkey Island two just immediately, right? Monkey Island one finished, and I went on vacation for two weeks, and I came back and I started working on Monkey Island two, and I do kind of wonder, right, if if we had had immediate feedback on the success of the game, maybe I wouldn't have been allowed to do Monkey Island two. But I could almost start Monkey Island 2 without knowing how well Monkey Island 1 did. And so maybe that was a, a kind of blessing in disguise a little bit with that. Wow. But I don't... You know, it's like Monkey Island 1 came out, and I mean, it did okay. It wasn't a, it wasn't a flop by any means. And then Monkey Island 2 came out, and I left Lucasfilm right after Monkey Island 2 came out. And so I didn't... Um, I don't know how well it did because I wasn't privy to any of that, you know, sales information after I left. But, you know, in some ways, and I know this sounds really bad, but I kind of forgot about the game, right? I mean, there were there were two games I did, and they were fun games, and I was very proud of the games. But at that point, I started Humongous Entertainment, and that was really my focus, right, which was making these adventure games for kids. And I kind of, in some ways, forgot about Monkey Island. And it really wasn't until probably 2003 or four when I started my blog and I started doing blogging stuff and there were just, just throngs of people would come to my blog, just crazy about Monkey Island. And that was actually a little bit of surprise for me. And I'm like, well, Monkey Island, that was like, you know, 10 years ago. Why are you still playing it? And, and that's, that's when I kind of, 
personally realized what an absolute cult following, you know, that those two games had was, mm-hmm. was when I, when I really, when I started my blog and I started interacting with people and, you know, I made a couple of, you know, trips to Europe just as vacations and stuff. And I thought, oh, it'd be fun to do little meetups with people. And just the sheer number of people that came to those meetups, right, just blew me away. So I was, I, I think that's the point that I kind of realized that, it had of the following that it had. Mm. I mean, it's fun. It's funny to hear that because I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here opposite my, you know, my big box Amiga copies of monkey Island and monkey <laughs> Island two. And that's kind of what I played them on as a kid. And, and, uh, you know, Amiga was huge, huge here. Um, but I, you know, everyone I know raved about monkey Island back then. And uh, that would have been just before my tenth birthday. It came out, so mm-hmm. yeah, we we loved it. So it's 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 strange to hear that um, you know it wasn't this huge huge success at the time. No, it wasn't, and I don't I don't know I don't know if it was even a huge success in Europe instantly. Right? It it may have taken a little time, you know to build and also you know around that time we didn't really have the internet right so europe was kind of this weird far off mystical land you know that you didn't you didn't really hear a lot about all the time and and it's like it, today that is just unfathomable right because i mean half my friends live in europe and i talk to them every single day right and and so back then there was this kind of like separation, you know, a little bit between the places just because of the, the lack of communication, you know, they, 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 you, you didn't have that you have today. So I think that's how things can kind of go underneath the radar, right? Unless you're really trying to probe what's going on with those things. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, Mickey, I may have been really popular and on all the magazine covers, but I never saw European magazines. Right. Mm. The, it's just it's the kind of thing that just doesn't make its way over here. Um, so unless you know somebody might have shown me something where today it's like, well, I can read all the same European websites that everybody does. And, you know, I can I can look at that stuff. So, uh, you know, I think kind of saying, well, I kind of forgot about Monkey Island and it became super popular, you know, behind my back in some ways. That's kind of unfathomable to happen today. Right, that would not happen today, just because of the internet and the way we're all connected. But you know, back then, that's you know that that kind of stuff could happen. Hmm. So um, obviously, big jump in technology from Maniac Mansion to uh, Monkey Island. Um, I believe um, Maniac Mansion had to be 64k total or something, um, being on the Commodore 64. Um, right. So what were the main advantages of that new techno- technology going into kind of the 16-bit era? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, resolution and color space were probably the two big things. And, of course, the mouse, right? I mean, Commodore 64 didn't have a mouse. I mean, I, th- mm-hmm. I think you probably could buy one, but nobody had one. So, you know, Maniac Mansion was all driven by joystick. And when we moved over to the PC, it really was the, you know, the PC port of Maniac Mansion that we had done that, you know, having a mouse really just kind of made a huge, a huge difference. Um, you know, being able to just click on stuff, I think really brought that, that interface, you know, from Maniac Mansion really alive, being able to use the mouse. Mm-hmm. Um, color space wasn't like initially a big deal. You know, the Commodore 64 had 16 colors. And when we first started doing PC games, we were fairly limited to, you know, doing EGA graphics, right? VGA was so brand new at the time that, we really couldn't take advantage of that. So it was all 16 colors. You know, Loom was 16 colors, and the initial version of Maniac Mansion was all 16 colors. And I think that's where some of Mark's Mark Ferrari's art really shined because he was just amazing at being able to dither, you know, doing these wonderful dithered pictures that brought out all new colors. But 
you know, we still only had 16 colors, right? All the way through the first version of Monkey Island. And it really wasn't until the VGA graphics became a lot more standard that we got access to 256 colors, which Maniac Mansion was in, you know, redone in. And I think when people play Maniac Mansion or play Monkey Island today, most people are playing the VGA version, right? It's mm -hmm. like if like if you're downloading Scum VM, um, which is what I used yesterday when I played the game. You know, you're you're yeah. You know, I was playing the 256 color version. I was not playing the 16 color version of, of Monkey Island. So you know, color space really changed, and then you know, I don't know that memory was really that big of a deal just because the scum system was really good at being able to shuffle stuff in and out of memory as you needed it. So, I mean, it did, the more memory did allow us to do more complex animations. And you really saw that starting with um, the last crusade game, you know, cause in maniac mansion, there are no, what we call special case animations, right? People walked and that was it. And, um, when Indiana Jones came out, we started doing kind of special animation. So when Indiana Jones had to do something special, there was this special animation that he would do that would only be seen in that one place in the game. And having more memory and more disk space kind of allowed us to do more of those. And then by the time Monkey Island came out, you know, we had even more disk space and even more memory to, you know, to, to play with. And so we could do even more, you know, of those special animations. So, I, and the resolution was a lot higher. Maniac Mansion on the Commodore 64 was 160 pixels across. And by the time Monkey Island came out, it was double that. So it was 320 pixels across. So having more resolution, more colors, you know, more memory, we're all, we're all kind of nice. But I don't think anything really fundamentally changed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like, oh, we can do 3D. Yeah. So, in the terms of that development process on the whole, were there any, any significant hurdles or sort of bumps in the road along the way? I don't, I don't remember any. No, I don't. I don't remember any point in the project where it's like you know, oh my God, we're screwed if this doesn't happen, or if you know this happens, so we're you know we're kind of screwed. I don't really remember anything like that. So I'm going to say no to that question. Okay. Um, so I, as I understand it, St Steven Spielberg used to pop his head in and out of the uh, games division, um, mm -hmm. and he was quite hands on with the games. So did he did he play Monkey Island during its uh, development? I don't know that he played it during this development. He did come in when we were making the Indiana Jones game. And he did he did play the Indiana Jones game, but I think Monkey Island he didn't play until after it had been released. He definitely played it after it had been released because I remember he used to call me at the office all the time looking for hints, you know, and and it's like I kind of became his personal hint line for stuff. <laughs> so wow, he definitely he definitely played it afterwards, and and I think. I mean, and I don't mean this in any disparaging way, but I think that he had called so many times that it kind of became a little bit of a joke among us. It's like, oh my God, Spielberg's on the phone. Here, you take it. No, you take it. You know, and we we're like passing him around because nobody wanted to talk to him anymore because he called so much. But, uh, but yeah, so he he definitely played it after, but I I don't remember any time that he had played it during its development. Right. Um, now, Disney, the big mouse, who obviously own uh, the the rights now to Monkey Island. I um, think they own the rights to pretty much everything, right? Yeah, that's it. They, yeah. they own literally the whole world. Um, <laughs> now, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, you, you wouldn't want to license Monkey Island. You would want to own it if you if you got to do a sort of 3A, is that right? Yeah, I think, you know, and, and again, it's not, it's not this, you know, this thing that, oh my God, I have to own it, right? I'm, I'm hoarding everything, right? It's not, it's not about that. It's about freedom, right? It's about the freedom to make the game I want and to kind of, you know, be, 
be able to participate in its success. I mean, I I made nothing off of Monkey Island except my salary. You know, I was I was paid I think sixty thousand dollars a year when I worked at Lucasfilm, and that was all the money that I made off of Monkey Island. And you know, it's kind of like oh, you know, if I, if I do something, it's like I want to kind of participate in its success, right? And I want to have the creative freedom to really make what I want to make, you know, without somebody else kind of hoarding over all of that. So I think, I think, I think that, you know, creatively being able to make what I want to make um, is probably the most important thing, you know, for me um, mm. as a, as a kind of, as opposed to owning. So obviously you, you I mean, you've had, presumably the, st the continuation of the story roughly mapped out for a while. Um, are you worried that that's just never going to see the light of day or, you know, um, I'm sure there's a lot of fans, myself included, that would love to kind of see the true uh, <laughs> progression of that story, not, not to, you know, obviously not to um, take anything away from the other games, but. Yeah. I, you know, I think, I don't think that story can ever be told, right? I think I think I think that literal like third Monkey Island story I had can never be told anymore, and I think it's because you know quite by coincidence some of the future games actually took pieces of that story, and they, they didn't know it. I mean it's just total coincidence, but in some ways it seems natural that they would do those things, and the other thing is I'm just I'm not the same person. I was back then, you know, I have spent what 35 years kind of growing as a designer and a storyteller and, and I'm just, I'm just a different person. Right. So it's not like I can dust off the old, you know, design document and go, okay, let's get started. Right. And build this game. Um, I, I think people would also be disappointed just because as a gamer, people have moved on, right. They've, they, they're, they're used to different types of things happening. They're used to interacting differently. And and so I th I think that, you know, a third Monkey Island that I would make, and I mentioned this on my blog, right? There's a lot of aspects of that, uh, you know, that I would want to keep the same and that I wouldn't change. But I think the story would have to change. I think the spirit of what's going on would remain, but the actual story would, would realistically have to change. Because mm. just too much time has progressed. Mm. But you're still keen, are you, to do it? Yeah, I would. I yeah. would love. I would love to be able to do it. So, have you have you formally approached Disney, or is it a sort of a case of knowing who to approach? And um, yeah. I don't know. It's it's a tricky question because it's a tricky it's a tricky thing, right? It's not like you call up whoever's the head of Disney and go, "Yo," yeah. or walk in with a suitcase full of cash. So it's just it's just it's a it's a complicated it's a complicated thing. Mm. And and I think that I mean the thing I have been told is that Disney does not sell IPs, right? I mean that was pretty clear. Yeah, it's like Disney does not sell IPs, so I think you know the odds of you know being able to you know just buy it back are are pretty remote. Right. Okay. Because I mean, Disney is not it's not a company that needs money, so it's not going to sell Monkey Island because it wants to make a new princess movie. You know, it's not trying to raise money to do that stuff. So mm. I think I think they're. It's just kind of not the thing, kind of thing they're going to do, but mm. you never know. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll all hold out hope that <laughs> one day it'll happen. Um, I yeah, I think that's pretty much my questions. Um, but yeah, just just want to say thank you so much for talking to me. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor. Um, and you know, where is my, this going to? Where is this going to appear? Where? Yeah. So this will be this will be on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um and hopefully on the on 15th of october which i believe is the 30th anniversary oh you know it's it's kind of weird <laughs> because 
because it's like it released in the U.S. on some date, and it's, there's the date we finished the game versus the game it first appeared in stores, and then it's when did it show up in Europe, and somewhere around that time. Right. I think it was actually September when, when, when we kind of sent the game off when we were done working on it. I think that was actually in September. Okay. But I don't know when it actually appeared in stores. But yeah, hopefully it'll be um, ready by then. And I've got a few people I want to try and pin down and, and we'll see. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's been a pleasure. Monkey Island, huge part of my kind of gaming history um, and, and love Thimbleweed Park. And yeah. Oh, thank you. Just a big fan. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your time. I realize you're busy, so. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. It was fun. Yeah, it was. Thank trip, you very trip much. Down memory lane. Yeah, that's it. <laughs>